Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Supplier Management Best Practice Trailblazer Albertsons, brought to you by IOFM and sponsored by Apex Analytics. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over before we get started. If you have any technical questions or issues using the WebEx platform, please use the chat box and I will respond right away. If you have any issues with audio, please click on the phone icon above the chat window to receive the teleconference info. For those that do call in, to ensure call quality, everyone's lines have been muted. If you happen to get disconnected, you can log on again using the instructions provided in your webinar confirmation email. If you continue to experience difficulty, please email webinars at iofm.com and we will respond as soon as we can. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box and hit send to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we will have our presenters answer these questions. We will have one polling question during the webinar. A pop-up box will appear when we run each poll. Please choose from the multiple choice answers and hit submit. We'd love to have your participation and insight. This webinar will be recorded and you'll receive a thank you email with the on-demand materials within two business days. Our first speaker today is Akilesh Agarwal, Senior Vice President of Global Senior Vice President Global Business Partner Technology Solutions at Apex Analytics. Akilesh leads Apex Analytics Solutions practice responsible for global technology solutions, including Apex Portal. Apex Portal is the 100% touchless solution for global supplier information management and working capital optimization. He leads the development of new client-focused software innovations guided by the regular trend analysis he conducts to ensure that Apex Portal delivers real-world world efficiency and productivity benefits. He also oversees pre-sales, product management, project planning and reviews, risk mitigation, and the delivery of seamless solutions to large global clients across country borders. Akalesh has an extensive background in product design and execution in accounts payable, accounts receivable, and related areas. We will also have Greg Maxwell, Group Vice President at Albertsons National, National Service Center. Greg is responsible for retail for all retail accounting processes. He leads the strategic direction of Shared Services Center with 10 directors and a team of 450 employees. He was previously Group Vice President at um, NAC's, NASC Controller Retail Accounting for Safeway. Greg has over 40 years of management, international and finance financial experience. He is a recognized best practice leader among his peers in shared services, finance, and retail grocery management. And finally, we will also hear from Mark Rousseau, president at Rousseau and Associates. Over the past 26 years, Mark has established himself as a thought leader on accounts payable, accounts receivable, payments, and document automation. A popular speaker at industry conferences and on webinars and podcasts, Rousseau advises prominent end users and service providers on how to use automation to improve document and payment driven business processes. Rousseau has chaired numerous educational conferences and has served on several industry committees and boards. He resides in Center City, Philadelphia with his wife and three sons. And at this time, I'd like to welcome our speakers and hand the webinar off to Akalesh. Thank you so much, Joey. Uh, this is actually Agarwal, and I'll be uh, uh, going over through today's webinar with Greg Maxwell. Uh, uh, just a bit about Apex. Uh, so we are a 30-year-old company uh, providing accounts payable audit services and technology solutions. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the journey of Albertsons and how they utilize the Apex portal uh, to their success. Uh, we have 40 million plus supplier records in our smart VM uh, database, which we are going to talk about briefly uh, uh, very soon. Uh, and we have 4 million plus suppliers in our Apex portal platform. Uh, some key client statistics that you can see on the screen. We have uh, two of the top uh, three energy companies, four out of the five pharma companies. Uh, three out of four banking and two out of three logistics uh, companies uh, as our clients. Uh, moving on, uh, 
just a few weeks ago, Spend Matters issued its spring 2021 solution map, and we are honored to be included in the upper right quadrant as a value leader by Spend Matters, but most importantly by our customers. So this is a, a really great achievement in my mind compared to all other competing offerings in the market. And overall, um, you know, we are have been designated the best in class supply and information va uh, management solution with validation capabilities, uh, dynamic workflow uh, configuration and rules engine, and obviously top performing risk modeling and monitoring capabilities that we are going to talk about today. Having said that, uh, today's agenda uh, will be covering, um, you know, about Albertsons. Uh, we are going to talk about the start of their journey on Apex Portal Supply Inquiry module and, and later on the registration module. Uh, the business case for automating registration, uh, the goals and expectations, uh, supply registration process flow, automated validation and change controls, how it was used for Albertsons. And lastly, we'll have a Q&A section. Having said that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Greg Maxwell. Uh, as uh, Jovi mentioned earlier, Greg is the group vice president for Albertsons National Service Center, and he's responsible for all retail accounting processes. Uh, he leads the strategic uh, team of shared service centers with nine directors and a team of 515 employees. And he has over 30 years of management uh, experience uh, in international as well as uh, uh, finance domains and is considered a recognized best practice leader. Greg is often our guest speaker at our elite conferences and has spoken previously on several topics related to retail and financial shared services. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Greg on this call. Thank you, Akhlesh, appreciate that. So as a brief introduction to Albertsons, here's a map and an overview of some key indicators about our company. Depending on where you're located in the US, you may know us under different names. Um, besides Albertsons and Safeway, we have Vons in Southern California. You can see Jewel up in the Chicago area, Shaw's up in Boston area, and Acme around Philadelphia. Um, so uh, we have over uh, 22 banners with nearly 70 billion in sales um, in the U.S. We also have over 2,200 store locations, and we have 300,000 employees that we pay each week from our shared service center here in Phoenix. So first, let me share some details about the partnership between Albertsons and Apex Analytics. We've had a long relationship with Apex. It started back in 2007 when I was with Safeway and we were live with their supplier inquiry software. At that time, I was looking for a way to automate the inquiries that were coming in from a growing number of suppliers. We found that many questions could be answered online and the Apex software was selected to streamline that process. And it was a quick win. We immediately had productivity and headcount benefits. In fact, we reduced our incoming calls by 80%. Over the years, we've enhanced the software by integrating it with our internal help desk system, ServiceNow. And more recently, we completed the latest Apex upgrade to the software. And now we have functionality that gives us more information on the supplier who is on the supplier, such as who is inquiring, their location, and the number of inquiries that they've made. Some major changes came about as our company grew. We had ongoing business process improvements at Safeway, and we were always looking for ways to improve the retail accounting, reduce our claims, expedite processes, and mitigate risk. We were well positioned when Albertsons and Safeway merged in January 2015. Our first task was to complete the integration of Albertsons to our in-house accounting systems following the merger. That process was completed in 2018. We immediately found opportunities when it came to vendor data and supplier management. Our vendor data was located in four different systems. Supplier setup involved 15 different documents spread throughout 10 departments in the company. Our vendor master had 170,000 records, which we have since reduced to 70,000 active vendors. In 2019, which is a pretty typical year for us, we added 20,000 vendors and made 12,000 12, vendor changes. 
a new supplier onboarding strategy was definitely needed in our company. After discussing the opportunities with supplier management, we identified several key objectives to our new, what we were looking for. First was to improve the cycle time so that we could make changes and set up vendors quickly and efficiently. We wanted to reduce paper, streamline the setup and the maintenance of all vendor information, make sure we were consistent, eliminate duplicate vendor records. Um, some of you may uh, have the same issue we did. Um, you could have uh, a vendor set up as Coke, um, you could have it set up as Coca-Cola, you could have it set up as Coca-Cola bottling. Um, so we had lots of uh, opportunities to eliminate duplicate vendor records. Um, conduct robust risk avoidance in checks and controls. And we wanted to manage our vendor setup through a workflow process and make sure that everything that went into our system was accurate. We wanted to perform validations like tax IDs, address validations, things like that banking information. Since the portal has gone live, we have acquired additional companies. Utilizing a self-service tool, the suppliers are now registering themselves, which speeds up our process and makes it more accurate. We were ultimately responsible for achieving all these objectives, but we wanted a solution that provided the most automation and extensive validations and verifications to save us the most time possible while improving ac accuracy. Now, Acklish will provide an overview of this new process that we implemented. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so the way Apex Portal was implemented for Albertsons is uh, a, a completely end-to-end -end workflow from the start of uh, inviting a supplier uh, with ultimately creating the supply in the client CRP, as well as uh, uh, the creating a golden record for Albertsons. So the way this workflow works is we start with the request a new supplier process. This is a very simple form in the Apex portal, which a potential buyer can fill out. Uh, once this form is filled out, which has minimal information like contact information about the supplier, an automated email goes out to the supplier, which is the supplier registration process. Over here, the supplier is able to agree to all of the terms of use, privacy policies, and provide first-hand information uh, to Albertsons about their bank account numbers, their tax IDs, um, any documents which are required. We do real-time validations on, on most of these data sets so that when Albertsons receives this data, they can be confident of the accuracy and validity of those data points. Uh, finally, it goes through an approval process where uh, one or more approvers within Albertsons uh, get to review the data and then finally make a decision whether to approve or reject the record. There's also an auto approve option. So if all validations pass, a lot of time can be saved by the system auto approving the record. Uh, finally, once the record is approved, uh, it can integrate with the ERP system. So in this case, Albertsons is looking uh, towards implementing the Oracle ERP system and currently uh, another ERP called Lawson is, is being used. Uh, once the data is created in the ERP, then we get a confirmation back in the Apex portal and an automated email is sent out to the supplier <laughs> announcing the creation of the vendor number and now the supply can start transacting with Albertson. So this eliminates all of the manual touch points that you would you have to do uh, being part of the vendor master team, and it increases all of the controls because they, they can't be bypassed. Yeah, and one of the additional benefits, Akhlesh, is the system, the portal, actually holds all the documents that we require for vendor setup. So you can, you can set up what you would like to, uh, to keep as a company but it could be the W-9s that you get, uh, diversity certification documents, um, lease agreements, um, reclamation agreement, your commodity guarantee, continued commodity guarantee, which we use as a retailer, um, bioterrorism um, agreements. So there's lots of different things that you can require during the setup and the portal holds all of those, um, which eliminates the paper and it, it enables anyone that has access to the system to access those documents. Thanks, Greg. And just to add to that, when certain documents expire, like certificate of insurance or a W-8, for example, 
the system is capable of automatically reaching out to the suppliers, informing them that the document is about to expire, they can upload a new one. So this eliminates the manual follow-ups uh, we have to do without a portal environment. Uh, so just a bit more about uh, the process flow. So uh, we talked about real-time validations uh, in the Apex portal platform, but how does that work? So behind the scenes, we have a smart VM uh, uh, technology that Apex uses. Uh, it was also offered as a API, meaning you can integrate it directly with a system of your choice. So what does smart VM do? Uh, it has real-time integration with over 650 plus uh, government data sources or mm -hmm. other regulatory data sources worldwide. And using a lot of this information, we are able to validate uh, uh, diversity information, for example. Uh, we can validate tax IDs for more than 56 countries in the world. We can validate if a vendor happens to be on a prohibited list uh, and we verify against 90 plus prohibited lists worldwide and, and so on and so forth. So overall, uh, we now have over uh, 40 million plus uh, supplier records uh, uh, in our smart VM database. It grows on a daily basis as we speak. And using a lot of this information, we can not only validate, but also score the accuracy of the data and enrich it when you have data missing in your existing window master. So validations plus append and enrichment where applicable. Uh, we also uh, care uh, deeply about security. So in terms of access controls, uh, you know, it starts with a solicited invitation as you previously saw in the workflow where only invited suppliers uh, get the credentials to first log into the system and provide the information. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have multi-factor authentication in place to avoid compromise of usernames and passwords where an imposter may get access to those credentials and then log into the system and manipulate data. So multi-factor authentication ensures that access is granted only to the authorized users using their work email address. So if a supplier leaves the supplier company and they are no longer employed, they will not be able to log into the Apex portal either. One of the most prevailing problems these days as we look at activities in any production database is sub, uh, the use of shared email addresses. So shared email addresses have been a big no from a security standpoint for uh, almost two decades now. But unfortunately, some suppliers will continue to use uh, shared mailboxes, meaning their passwords are known to multiple people in the organization with very little control over who has those uh, passwords. In the end, this uh, adds a lot of risk to the supplier data uh, in any environment, whether it's supplier's own network or the third party systems that they may access. So we highly discourage the use of shared mailboxes. And this is something that Apex Portal uh, presents to you in an approval queue as well. So when you're approving the record, uh, you can uh, take a look at the email addresses and make sure it's not a shared mailbox. But what we are seeing as an industry trend is that is the most common way of uh, committing a potential fraud. Uh, a, a bit more on other access controls. So we validate uh, IP addresses of the suppliers. We validate bank account information, including the ownership uh, information about the supplier for many countries in the world. We do a previous bank account number test as well. So if a supplier logs in and they attempt to change their bank account, they have to enter the full bank account number, which is already existing on file before they are allowed to change to a new one. So this is also going to prevent uh, a potential fraud. So those are the uh, some of the access controls and how we are protecting uh, against uh, potential fraud and uh, you know, securing the data set. Having said that, uh, once a supplier has registered and once they have submitted the information, I talked about the approval queues. 
So in terms of the approval queues, uh, you know, the information which was entered before is presented and the supplier can approve it. Uh, another example is, you know, when a supplier is making changes, there is typically an urgency around um, making the changes on a really fast manner. So over here, Greg, uh, do you want to share some examples where you know Albertsons was able to uh, prevent some potential frauds? Yeah, sure, Eklish. We've had uh, have lots of examples, but I'll share a couple just to give you an idea of what the system can do. Um, and like you said, when a supplier um, sends an urgent email and says, "Hey, I I put something in the system. I'm waiting for you to respond. Can you hurry up and change it?" That's kind of a a, a red light right there. Um, but what happens with the Apex portal is it goes to the online validation and that occurred in this case and it came back with a verification response decline. So when it does that, we take another look, we review the email. And in this case, we contacted the supplier and confirmed that this was not initiated by them. Um, so we did not make the bank change that was asked for because it was fraud. Someone had actually got into the vendor's email system um, and it was a bad actor through their email system. So it prevented us from changing a bank account um, inadvertently. Another example where a supplier selected an ACH payment method. And um, so what, what the validation process does is it takes the business name, the TIN, and the social security number associated with the bank account, and that all failed um, with the integrated verification response. Um, and so again, we declined to change from check to ACH because um, none of those items matched up. So just a, a little bit of a um, view into what the verification system does, and it does it all very quickly without us having to, uh, to track all that down. Thanks, Greg. And this is a view of how that uh, approval process looks like. So uh, let's assume there were a, a couple of changes like change in tax ID or change in address or bank account. So when an approval uh, approver views that record, they see the old data on the left side, the new data set on the right side, and they are easily able to compare exactly the peer exchange. And all of this information is, is logged in an audit log that can be used for SOC 1, SOC 2, SSA uh, 18 audit and, and so on and so forth. So uh, any approved changes will go to the ERP uh, again, in informs uh, the supplier about the changes and the cycle keeps uh, going on. So at the beginning, I, I talked about uh, kind of the business case and expectations that we had for supplier registration. And this is really a summary of all that information. Uh, we were looking for a single source of truth for vendor data um, and a place to store all the documents. And uh, this, uh, this port allowed us to do that. We wanted to reduce the time needed for vendor onboarding and maintenance, um, improve our speed to market so we could get the vendors set up um, and accept product as quickly as possible. We wanted to eliminate the manual tracking of the vendor setup, um, which was being done. Went to several different departments um, and we had a lot of paper and utilizing the new workflow driven process was a huge benefit for us. We reduced in, we wanted to reduce invalid vendor information get real-time validation, auto error correction, um, and duplicate checks to make sure that everything was accurate. Um, and the system does that. We wanted to decrease the handling of physical documents like I talked about. Um, and then Akhlesh mentioned this earlier, but when documents do expire, whether it's a certificate of insurance or whatever we have in the system, the system alerts us to that and sends an email um, automatically to the vendor requesting an update to those documents. And then lastly, we wanted the ability to mass communicate with all vendors, and we're able to do that now that we have this all in one place with all our vendors set up in the in the portal. Akhlesh, I think you're going to do a, a poll next, right? Uh, that's correct, Greg. So uh, if all of you can take a moment to uh, uh, answer to this poll question, uh, and, and we'll uh, now get, uh, get down to the Q&A section. Uh, and, uh, Greg and I are really happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. 
Indeed, while you're responding to the poll question, if you haven't already submitted your question for Greg or Akalesh, go ahead and do so now. Of course, we also invite you to submit another question if you have already one in the queue, and I notice a number of you have done so. So let's go to our first question from an attendee. Akalesh, I think this one's for you. One of our attendees wants to know, does Apex have a database so that it, if they already have information from a supplier, the steps can be reduced? Yes, uh, and that's what the smart VM uh, database is. Uh, so it consists of 40 million supplier records worldwide. So we already have that database and we know the address of the supplier, we know the tax ID of the supplier and so on and so forth. So when a new invitation is sent out for your instance of the Apex portal, uh, uh, the supplier's information can be pre-filled out based on that information from smart VM. Right. And now, once that information is filled out, the supply can uh, either say, yes, I want to use the exact same data point for uh, the, the new client they're registering for, or they may have a different point of contact for this client or a different remit address they want to use. So at which point they can uh, fine tune that data set and then submit the record. So we do, uh, uh, you know, uh, apply the ease of use for the suppliers from our smart VM database, but we also are able to apply client specific business logic so that any client, including Albertsons or other logos, they can capture the data they, they really want so that they can do business with the supplier. So it's best of the both worlds. Akalish, I think this question is also for you. Another attendee is wondering whether you can use industry specific databases to validate supplier information. Yes, so we, uh, if I understand the question correctly, the industry specific databases would be, uh, for example, the healthcare industry, right? So we do validate against that. So we are able to find out any prohibited uh, healthcare providers, for example. Similarly, there's a department of transportation database that we connect to, and there are clients who want to validate uh, any suppliers in the transportation industry and, and so on and so forth. So, yes, we have various examples of connecting to industry specific databases uh, for validation. Greg, an attendee is wondering, how do you handle foreign vendors such as WBNE, BENE? Uh, so same way, uh, instead of a W8, we get a W9 um, and we track them the same way, but they use the self-service portal just like any other vendor. Akalish, what capabilities are in this solution to help streamline the onboarding of foreign suppliers? Sure. Uh, so just like a U.S. vendor, foreign suppliers also get a lot of benefit uh, during the onboarding process. So uh, it starts with validating the foreign supplier's name with the tax ID. So even for suppliers in Europe, for example, India, Australia, Malaysia, and the list goes on. For more than 56 countries worldwide, we still validate the name of the vendor to their tax IDs and make sure they're valid, right? UK, for example, has a corporate criminal offense act, uh, the UK CCO Act. So by that act, every supply in UK must have a valid VAT number, and the client is obligated to validate it once a year, otherwise they face criminal charges. Uh, so uh, the same way we validate VAT numbers for all of Europe and many other countries. Uh, India, for example, has GST, and we validate that as well. Uh, the next step is global address validation for an international supplier. So uh, for a lot of countries in the world, uh, on a global basis, we are able to validate uh, the right address for that supplier. Then moving on to the banking screen, which is very critical, how are you going to pay the supplier? So whether it's a US supplier or international, the first thing we do on banking is we validate the routing number, the SWIFT code, the IBAN number, uh, the Klabi number or other routing numbers as the case may be for all countries in the world. Once we have validated that bank master information, then for certain countries in the world, uh, like for example in Sweden, uh, for India, for Poland, and even United States, we can validate the account ownership uh, through the relevant databases in those countries. And lastly, Apex has a, a bank account ownership score. So what that means is for all countries in the world, 
uh, because we have 40 million plus supplier records and a lot of bank accounts associated with those suppliers, we are able to scorecard how likely the account uh, number belongs to the supplier uh, and, and also identify that and uh, give that information to you. So that, that's a very recently uh, launched feature, the bank account ownership score, uh, but we are able to use that. And lastly, for international suppliers, documentation, as Greg mentioned, the capturing WH or other types of documents we capture and send automatic reminders. And specific to WH, we have also recently uh, introduced a new feature where a substitute WH can be e-signed by the supplier and IRS uh, has approved that as well. Another attendee writes, many foreign suppliers don't have a US TIN. How can you validate their information in this case? Yes, so US TIN is typically issued uh, for a, a foreign supplier doing business with US and actually providing um, services on US soil, right? So that's where a US TIN typically comes in for international vendors, but uh, even if the vendor is saying UK or Ireland or Germany, et cetera, they'll get their local tax IDs and we actually connect to the EU VAT registry. We connect to the uh, Australia, Malaysia, South Africa, Canada even, uh, all those local tax authority databases to va verify their tax IDs. Greg Attendee wants to know, in a typical setup, how long does the process take from supplier registration to ERP system approval? So great question. It really depends on the supplier if they answer all the questions. So there's some required questions that we put in that you can actually select as a company, um, which questions are mandatory and which are optional. Um, once they finish all those mandatory questions, we usually have the vendor set up in three to five days. So it's a fairly, fairly quick process because we still want to validate and we do a little bit of auto approval, but we still want to validate that everything was complete and that all the records are there. What's a best in class performance, Akalesh, and what's a sign that it's taking too long in your organization to set them up? Sure. Uh, so it varies by industry, but a typical baseline benchmark is less than five working days to set up a new supplier for 80% of new supply requests. So that's what we track as a standard report. Now, uh, like Greg mentioned, if the supplier is active and, and they're willing to provide the information quickly, I've seen suppliers register from start to finish in less than one hour, right? So they get the invite, they fill out the form, it goes through an approval process, and it can be created in real time in, in an ERP all in less than 60 minutes. Uh, we, we have seen a lot of cases like that. But the industry benchmark is like uh, not all suppliers are going to be at their computers every minute. So in less than five working days, as long as you're uh, able to set up the supplier from sending that invite, registering approval process, integrating with ERP, if that works within less than five working days, you're good. Greg, an yeah. attendee wants to know whether you have different setup process for government entities and utility providers. So you can uh, set the system up to uh, change the requirements for eight, uh, different types of vendors. Um, so that's uh, totally um, uh, configurable within the system. So whatever you need for, for the different suppliers. So Akalesh, what are some ways that other Apex clients are handling government entities and utility providers? Sure. So typically uh, with any government you, uh, provider or utility provider, they're not going to log into the portal and register, right? So there's a proxy creation mode. Uh, so limited uh, people within uh, Albertsons or any other client would have access to that feature. So when you need to pay a government vendor, or utility vendor, board of directors, or other similar entities, you use the create pro uh, profile feature. It, it uh, allows you to enter the data on behalf of the supplier. It still goes through all of the validations, data enrichment processes, workflow approvals, and so on. And then finally, that vendor is created. So a complete access control, and you don't have to go to the ERP to create these vendors. Uh, Kalesh, uh, an attendee wants to know, how does the system deal with in-market local language requirements, such as using Japanese katakana for local payments? 
uh, that's a great question. So one of the benefits of uh, Apex portal is it comes with 180,000 uh, business rules pre-configured out of the box. And uh, specific to this question, uh, these rules are built in and part of those 180,000 business rules. So uh, for Japan, it's a kanji name or katakana name, right? Uh, similarly, uh, if the vendors in South Korea or Philippines or Taiwan or China and so on, there are other local language names uh, which are variants for that window. So what we are able to do is detect uh, the country of the supply and where the bank uh, is located. And depending on a domestic payment versus an international payment for a Japanese vendor, we'll ask the Kana name or a Kanji name and we'll attach it to that bank profile so that your payments go through and uh, they don't get rejected. So all of these rules are pre-configured and you can take advantage of them out of the box. Another question for you, Akalesh, an attendee wants to know, how do you validate the VAT for the UK? We used to do VAT check, but now since the UK has been removed from the European nation, how do we do it? Great question. So we used to do it, like you said, um, uh, through the EU VAT registry, but now after the Brexit, in a matter of only two working days, Apex was able to adopt uh, the integration with the UK company house database. So the UK company house database allows us to validate not only the VAT number, but certain other uh, business registration numbers for UK. And that's what we use now for the VAT validation. Greg, an attendee wants to know whether you're, you're grouping supplier records such as parent-child connections. And if so, if you make a change in one of the records, does it flow through to the other records? Greg? Akalesh, I'll let you take that question. Sure. So oh, I, I got it. I got it, Akalesh. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so, um, the, the portal takes whatever is in your master file and you can merge suppliers together, um, within apex if you want to, but, um, it's really based more on how your master file is set up that you're bringing into the portal, but go ahead, Aklish, if you can add to that. Sure. Uh, like Greg mentioned, there's a merge supplier feature. So typically before implementing an apex portal, you will have all these, uh, vendor master records, which are disjointed and not write mm -hmm. to each other, maybe multiple remits, multiple locations, depending on the ERP you're using, or even corporate hierarchy, right? So when we initially load the vendor master file, it will load as is, but Smart VM will do a duplicate check and provide recommendations on a possible merge and, and uh, automatic grouping of those vendors. Uh, so merge vendor step one. Now, once the vendor is merged, if they, uh, update the address information, tax ID, bank account, any and all addresses associated or locations associated with it will get that update uh, uh, in, in real time automatically, right? Now, on top of that, uh, Apex Portal offers an option for that parent-child corporate hierarchy linkage. And how that works is once that link is established, uh, then you have an option to take the supply data and update certain attributes like payment terms, uh, payment methods, and so on, on a global basis. So that's how other clients are typically using the system. Greg, an attendee wants to know, are you checking the W8 for completeness and accuracy? So the system actually does that for us. Um, so you don't have someone that just uh, turns in a W8 and, and Oculus can probably explain how that works, but um, they can't just write write anything on a W-8 and it comes to, it's actually looking to make sure that the fields are completed accurately. Uh, thanks, Greg. And uh, just to add to that, how we do it is uh, we use uh, document recognition. So what it means is uh, the system has determined a W-8 is required, but a vendor, uh, what if they upload a picture of a dog, right? Which is nowhere close to a W-8. So a lot of these standard forms like W-8s, W-9s, California 590s, and other standard forms, we are able to train the system in looking out, uh, at the, looking at the picture of that document and learning from it, learning from thousands of submitted documents from previous submissions, 
And once the system is trained, it can recognize, yes, that's the right W8 and it has been filled out, so let me accept it. Otherwise, it will reject it. So that's how it works and not only for W8. If you have a standard form, we can train the system to look out for it. Greg, one of our attendees wants to know, how does the portal manage and update supplier email addresses that are no longer valid? Well, it doesn't do that automatically. <laughs> Um, that's a manual effort, and as we learn, we have to keep that updated um, in, the, in the system. So um, if we update it in our vendor master, that will pass to the portal. Um, and so we try to keep that updated as often as we can when, when we know there's a change. We know that email addresses are a, could be the bait of an AP yeah. leader's existence. Uh, Akalesh, how, how, does, how does the solution help make this process easier? Sure. So one of the key things is like uh, we, when we talk about the invite form, right? Uh, when the initial onboarding starts. So one of the data points we capture is email address. So the, when the buyer enters that email address, we'll take that email and first verify if it's in the right format. But on top of it, we actually verify whether it's uh, an email address which can be uh, used for de delivery of emails, right? So what if there is no email server running with that email address or it no longer exists? So the system will identify that and prevent the usage of that email address. Uh, now, subsequently, uh, if the supplier has logged in or there's an update to the profile, when we do those real-time validations, other than tax ID address, bank validation, and so on, we'll also uh, validate emails, right? So if we find that the email address is no longer valid, we log an event for it in the vendor controls and the approval queues, we'll see the email is no longer valid and needs to be updated. And then as a client, uh, you are able to take action on it. Greg, another attendee wants to know how this solution helps you with your 1099 processing. Yeah, so 1099s are uh, um, uh, uh, always a, a challenge. And, uh, but but for us, eliminating B notices um, where we're missing tax IDs is a big deal. And um, this has really helped us do that. We're able to um, handle the volume of all the changes and additions, and it really has eliminated a lot of the B notices that we used to get by using their system. Yeah, how does this solution help with 1099 reporting, Akalesh? Yeah, so um, we are able to, first of all, like Greg mentioned, you know, uh, validate the tax IDs and addresses so for accuracy and uh, it's always up to date. Uh, but we are also able to capture certain additional data points in the vendor master. So for example, uh, 1099 form typically has a purpose code attached to it. So the vendor master can be flagged with similar purpose codes. So now that your ERP has the information, you can use it to generate 1099s, right? And, and then with uh, the implementation of both the supply inquiry module as well as the registration module. Once you have the spend information in the portal, you can even drive some business rules on when that field for 1099 would be required based on the dollar amount that you're spending, right? So those are some examples. So we don't generate 1099s out of the Apex portal, but uh, we definitely help with that process. Greg, one of our attendees wants to know more about how you trained your internal staff as well as suppliers on the new system. Yeah, that's good. Apex was, has been a huge help. Um, they have a robust internal training process. And um, so internally, we used um, Apexes. And externally, the product is actually very intuitive and it walks the vendor through each step. So. Um, we do have an email address if people have issues. Um, and then also we use Teams here at Albertsons and we have an open Teams channel. So if there's any questions internally, they can uh, post a question on that Teams channel and it gets answered pretty much immediately. Another attendee is wondering what, how the supplier registration process for retailers might be different than other industries. Is there unique information you're collecting, Greg? Uh, I, I'm not sure because I'm just the one industry. <laughs> I, mean, I came from C. I can answer CPG and retailers, but I don't know about healthcare and pharma. Um, they're, they're probably. I mean, we use continuing commodity guarantee, and that's probably a specific um, retail type document that we collect. Um, you know, earlier in the in the um, call, I mentioned several of the documents that we collect, and again, all that's configurable. 
So depending on your industry, if you have different documents, it's very easy to set up in the Apex portal um, so that you can uh, put what's mandatory or what's optional um, for the documents you'd like to collect and put into the system. Akalish, a couple of attendees are want to know more about access controls, and this doesn't surprise me with what's happened over the past 14 months with our shift to work from home. Make everybody feel better about things, Akalish. Sure. So on access controls, uh, you know, one is uh, we got to be aware and mindful of who's accessing the system, right? So started from the solicited invitation, onboarding, et cetera, but uh, going forward as people are working from home, one of the key things is where are they logging in from? So the IP address is one of the uh, things that we log uh, for access controls. And if we detect a, a change in that IP address, meaning the location from where they're logging in, we trigger the multi-factor authentication all over again, and we ask that the supplier authenticates using their work email before they are granted access to the system. We also have a suspicious IP detection. Uh, what that means is if you log in from US and 10 minutes later, you're logging in from Nigeria or North Korea or other locations, that's very suspicious activity. We call it impossible travel, and we will flag the supplier profile for suspicious IP. Uh, then, uh, once, let's assume you have logged in, uh, if we detect other suspicious activities, we'll also trigger a security question and answer. So what that means is uh, you were able to log in with the password. You were able to provide multi-factor authentication code through your work email. But do you know the answers to your security question that you previously set up? And, and that helps mitigating fraud. Let's assume I also answered the security questions and managed to get in. Now, uh, a fraudster is typically trying to get a, a payment. So their first attempt in making a change to the supplier profile is usually contact information over the bank account. So when we, they get to the bank account number screen and they try to make a change, we also have a previous bank account number test what that means is we mask the existing bank account number. We don't display it to the end user, even if it is a supplier login. And in order to change that account number to a new one, I need to know and enter the previous account number on file. Complete, not just the last four digits, the exact number uh, on file. And only when it matches, we allow that change. So a lot of uh, checks and balances are in place before allowing the change. Now, once the change is made, we also have additional validation saying, okay, is, is the email domain correct? Um, is the uh, new bank account which was entered, like the examples Greg provided earlier, uh, does it match the tax ID of the vendor and the ownership on the bank's profile for US banks? Uh, we do the same thing for uh, multiple other countries. And then lastly, we have that account ownership score. So there's a whole collection of activities that goes on into preventing fraud. Uh, I've not covered all of them, but just wanted to give some examples. Well, I've got a couple of, of follow-up questions, so, so, so don't go anywhere. The first one is, is fraud protection included in the standard product? So all of the validations that I talked about, uh, including access controls, uh, they come as part of the registration module. There are some add-ons, like the bank account ownership check is an add-on. The bank account uh, ownership accuracy score, which is an Apex proprietary score, is an add-on. So these are the two add-ons. Outside of these two add-ons, all of the checks and balances we talked about is part of the standard offering. Another yeah. attendee wants to know whether the solution can prevent suspected fraudulent emails from ever arriving in the in the email box of a user. Exactly. So we, we actually have that big dent to our solution. Uh, thanks for asking that question, actually. So as part of the implementation, Communication is to the suppliers is very important, right? So what we do is we don't send emails from at apexanalytics.com because the supplier may not know who Apex is. 
So the email communication that goes out from the portal is in this case, albertsons.com or your domain.com as a client. So the suppliers, first of all, are familiar with that domain and they're expecting emails from, from you and not Apex. The second thing we do is we have implemented uh, a, a technology solution called uh, DKIM or SPF. So what that really means is we are validating the domain of the sender, in this case, albertsons.com. And when the supplier gets that email, it's marked as validated. So the supplier's mail server and the supplier's email account has confidence that the email really came from Albertsons and it's not an imposter trying to pretend to be Albertsons. So that's how we are able to prevent emails from going into the spam folder and they uh, make it to the inbox. Now, if there's an impersonated email, the, that validation which I'm talking about will fail and those emails will go to the spam folder instead. Greg, what's the single biggest piece of advice you'd give to the folks on the line today who are considering automating their supplier registration process or upgrading to new technology? I would say don't wait as long as we did. Um, <laughs> there, there are so many benefits to this, especially, I mean, like I said, we have 70,000 vendors, Mark, and, um, you know, fraud checks are, are one huge benefit that we saw, probably the bigger benefit than we expected. Um, on, on the bank account checks and the different um, email checks and everything Aklesh just talked about. Um, but just the, um, the workflow process and getting rid of all the paper and the different departments that it went to before, there are so many benefits that um, we didn't even envision uh, when we first started this process. So um, it, it's uh, just the efficiencies that we've gained um, and the organization's been, uh, been phenomenal. Uh, Kalesh, what advice would you give to the folks on the line today as they go about evaluating automated solutions for supplier registration? Yeah, so uh, when you're evaluating any solution, uh, look for a solution you can run uh, on the cloud, for example, because uh, an on-site implementation typically takes a lot of maintenance and time, uh, increases your budget. Look for a product which is configurable. Uh, we can all talk about customization, uh, but configurable is the key to success because you are able to add your business processes, workflows uh, to that offering. Also look for what do you get out of the box as a standard best practice solution. So I talked about 180,000 business rules. Um, uh, so as you're evaluating products, uh, check on how many global business rules are built into the offering, how many validations. Validation doesn't mean checking the format of the data, meaning actually checking against government databases, how many are, of those are built in, and how easily you can integrate with your ERP system. So those are uh, some of the guiding principles. Uh, also, look for best practice adoption. You just don't want to take your existing process in and re uh, re reinvent it uh, in a portal environment. Uh, you also want to adopt best practices and simplify to the maximum extent possible. Greg Akalesh, thank you so much for an excellent presentation and for sharing your insights with us today. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to join us. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jovi. Ms. Jovi. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so that's about all the time we have for today's program. I just have a few housekeeping notes to go over before we officially close out. If you could please fill out the short evaluation form that will appear once you close the webinar, this will better help us serve your needs in future webinars. Um, and as a reminder, the on-demand materials will be emailed to everyone within two business days. This will include the link to the recording of today's presentation. Um, thank you again to Mark, Greg, and Akalesh for a great presentation today. And thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy days to join us. This webinar was brought to you by IOFM and sponsored by Apex Analytics. Thank you all and have a great day.